Now, I think we can all agree that the melee moves in Resident Evil 4 Remake are pretty satisfying. They were just a thing of beauty, and by my fourth playthrough, I was absolutely addicted to suplexing old ladies into piles of cow shit. That being said, whilst it was fun in those specific moments, do you think you could beat Resident Evil 4 Remake using only melee moves? Now, the obvious question you'll probably have would be, how could any mortal man achieve this power instead of waiting for the usual in-game prompts? Well, with the help of a few mods, we can now download the collective martial arts knowledge of Steven Seagal direct from the Matrix itself, allowing us to melee at the simple press of a button, and also kick doors open like in the OG, which is kind of dope. So the challenge opens up with news that the president's daughter Ashley had been kidnapped. Leon had been sent in to rescue her, but he'd not been heard from for several hours now. With our hero MIA and the president's daughter at risk, there was only one man left who had the biceps, the panache, and the alpha male physique to attempt such a mission. We are of course referring to the White House's other top guy, Jack. The only stumbling point for us here was that Leon had also taken all of the equipment and weapons with him, meaning we had no budget for guns, knives, or gadgets from the Q branch. So after getting dropped off at Leon's last known location with nothing but our bare feet and knuckles, we get a chance to demonstrate our physical prowess by giving the first human trafficker we find a taste of what was to come. Hello there. We kick his door off its hinges and apply our foot so hard to his face that he was now seeing the world sideways. Remember when Bobby Boucher? Showed up at halftime in the Mud Dogs won the bourbon bowl. On investigation, a map in his bedroom gives us a clue as to Leon and Ashley's whereabouts, and we press onwards towards the village square. As we arrive at the town centre, the occupants of Pueblo appear to be setting up for their annual village fate. Now, not being a massive fan of medium rare policemen myself, I was still a good guest brought the knuckle sandwiches instead. As we turn the pinnacle event in the village's community calendar into a violent bloodbath, we get a moment to quickly cover the rules as we beat the attendees into mashed potato. Throughout this playthrough, I was only allowed to use melee attacks. There were no guns or knives allowed at any time, and any enemies would need to be fisted or footed. We did carry a pistol round with us just in case of emergencies and for puzzles, and I was going to give us a pass at all the usual non-optional segments of the game. And just like that, as the prophesied holy flaming cow arrived to mark the end of the village section, we turn around to proudly examine the trail of severed arms and legs that we'd left behind. After we clear out the windmill and fishing village, the clues we'd found led us to the basement of an abandoned house, where we slip on a banana pill and miss a pretty comical kick on the door before finding the Spanish Chad Luis bagged and gagged. We question him on Leon and Ashley's whereabouts, and he reveals to us that Leon was being held in the church up towards the lake. That's great, thanks Luis. And we leave him as we found him to avoid raising any suspicions. With our new intel in hand, we arrive at the mountainside and rechristen this place to Kilimanjaro stripping these villagers of their dignity and severing limb after limb to add to our collection. We grab the crank to open up the next area and meet up with the doctor for our second appointment of the day, and this time we turn Salvador from the doctor to the patient. Now, I'm able to talk from experience here, but nothing ruins a person's day more than being kicked in the face whilst doing a shit. Following this serious act of antisocial behaviour on the house grounds, the head of the village Gestapo arrives and provides us with a taste of our own medicine, which, I'll tell you, was not pleasant, and gives us a stern warning about kicking anybody else whilst they're on the toilet. Next up, we fall for the same trap as the AI dog, which had me questioning my sanity, and whilst we may have complete contempt and disregard for human life, we would never leave any dog or animal in trouble. A statement I immediately contradict as I commit a series of felony animal abuse offences back in the village town centre. I can smell you. Next up was the swamp section, which was pretty easy. We go one-on-one -on -one with the pig boy and help to transport the rest of the souls here to the afterlife. We use all the petrol to fill the boat up, sending a massive middle finger to whoever wrote this note before concluding our fight with Jaws on the lake. Next up on our to-do list was to retrieve the church key. The first stone head was easy to get as always, but we have to apply some toe punts to our welcome party at the south side of the lake to get the second one. With the key successfully retrieved, we make our way back to the church. However, the optimistic spring in our step is brought to an abrupt end as this man mounted stops us in our tracks and demands a trial by combat. I'll admit, as I stood there with hot fear-induced urine running down my leg, I became slightly concerned by the prospect of this fight. There was no evidence to suggest that we'd even be able to do damage to the big guy with melee attacks. You never get the prompt in a normal run-through, so our attacks could end up doing nothing. It was a pretty brutal exchange. El Gigante had his own moves that we had to contend with, and our fingers were starting to get numb from hammering melee over and over again. However, size wasn't everything. Thank the gods. And with us being the more agile fighter, we wear down El Gigante's ankles to the bone, and with no leg integrity left, he collapses to the floor. It might have been tough, but our biggest worry early game had been conquered. On reaching the church, we call out for Leon and find him locked in a small storage room upstairs. This was a devastating moment. Leon had clearly been starved, and the villager's method of torture was horrifying. He'd been forced to watch the most disturbing videos imaginable on repeat. The man was a shell of his former self, so we take him in our arms, give him a little kiss on the forehead, and tell him that Jack was here to take him home. With Leon retrieved, we could move on to our next objective, which was finding Ashley. 
With the weather drawing in, Luis kindly invites us in for some hot tub action and margaritas, but before we can get the party started, a bunch of Karens arrive to disrupt the fun. There was no way we were letting them ruin this moment for us, so we turn up our shoelaces, begin applying and force death fire our steel toe cap crocs. Just before being overrun, Leon saves the day and finds us an escape route out of the cabin. We continue to drastically reduce the quality of life for the villagers and chainsaw women, who think that they've trapped me inside their Cambodian death camp, but none of them seem to understand. I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me! With this martial arts masterclass, we slap both of these two into next Tuesday, retrieving the crank before stumbling into Mendez on the road to the castle. He tries to manhandle Leon and run off of him, so we do some tasteception and give Mendez a taste of the medicine that he'd given us a taste of that we'd originally given the taste of to the man on the toilet. What's going on with you? What are you talking about? You sound insane. <laughs> Anyways, Fight Club was about to begin, and rule one of Fight Club was that if you had no hair, you had to fight. Phase 1 Mendez was no trouble at all, but Phase 2 had me concerned. I thought that if he hung around in the rafters like some creepy sex offender, we may not be able to reach him to deal any damage. But don't be alarmed. We spread those cheeks now they're on the floor next to us and optimize the time that he spent down on the ground floor. Now, and with one final kick, we send Mendez to the Shadow Realm and progress up to the castle. When we loaded in the next day, something didn't feel quite right. But with a quick F5 refresh of the Matrix, everything was back to normal again. We give Salazar's front door a light knock to see if he was home, Hello. and then he starts giving us his long, drawn out welcome speech. The castle's medieval attempts to stop me in my tracks were kind of cute. Despite these shoeless pedophiles upgrading their weaponry to scythes, flails, and shields, we apply lines of the finest pain directly to their nostrils. I mean, sure, we do fall into the Garador sex dungeon, which ends up being a tough fight. This universe's version of Daredevil packs some serious combos, but even the Garador's beautifully sculpted abs and muscular exterior could only last so long. Our success in the dungeon is sadly overshadowed by a few mini slip-ups in the next area. Leading up to the water room, we have to use our pistol to shoot out the lanterns to open up the door for the sword puzzle, and not having go-go gadget legs was a problem for the water room itself. The first section was a breeze, but we wouldn't be able to deal with the cretins up top as Leon tends to the cranks. So rather than kill these people, we use our patent pending pacifist strategy from the last video, which if you're interested you can see here, to get Leon across to both sides and raise the two platforms with no kills and no usages of guns. Admittedly, we do have to use some flashes here, but let me know in the the comments if you think I'm a big fat failure. After the war room, Leon starts to look a bit weird, so we tell him to rest up in the room ahead and we'd pick him up later on. Despite the lactic acid building up in our legs and the crippling RSI I had appearing on my fingers and wrists, we do a spot of fly kick fishing before walking into the set of the Exorcist. Rather than choose violence in the presence of the Lord himself, we stroll up there to ask politely for this guy's lantern, but before we can ask him, his bouncer restrains me and the red bathrobe guy makes a break for it. Which annoyed me actually, because I was the one trying to take the moral high ground here and you were forcing me to kill you. So we give these religious extremists exactly what they deserve and eventually catch up to the red guy. <laughs> Once he was in our grasp, there was no escaping. We again are forced to shoot down the drawbridge locks, fighting our way through the endless horde of tattooed troglodytes in the process before meeting our future nemesis, the armoured cave troll. We make it to the cannon and turn him into Harvey Two-Face, but this was an action that would begin his villain arc and come back to change the course of this run forever. We circle back and check in with Leon, who's now feeling fully rested before committing more animal cruelty to the dog's position around the maze. Next up, we're expected to grab the three pieces to complete the Chimera puzzle. As always, the snake's head was easy to retrieve, and for the lion's head, we're required to forge these armoured hemorrhoids into tinfoil before heading over to the goat's head room. After we get bamboozled by this guy, we have to head over to flip the switch for the bridge where the red demon jumps me with all his plaga mates and we take a pacing. Now, you may think that we'd not have much to say about Leon's solo adventure down to the basement to retrieve the insignia, but remember this is Leon's section, not Ashley's. Alexa, play the Doomslayer music. These metallic degenerates thought that they were going to have another day of bullying a young teenage girl, but instead they get some satisfying karmic justice for all those jump scares on our first playthrough. Next up on the menu was a main course of Navistadors, which was to be served with a side dish of pain. These little llama spitting reprobates stood no chance and eventually resorted to flying away and carrying in fear in the corner until I'd left the area. The game then thinks that multiplying the Garador count for this room by two would be enough to stop us, and to be fair it nearly was. This fight was tough, and at one moment I thought that I might die of arthritis before I beat them. I'd literally soaked myself with about 13 first aid sprays here and things were looking bleak, but through our sheer reluctance to yield, we enter stealth mode and float like a ghost in and out of their ear range, isolating both of them from each other, kicking them in the back of the head when they weren't looking, and taking them down one by one. After exploring the basement area, it was time to take on the main man's right hand, who he sent to dispose of us. Now, any other mere mortal here would be tightening up the Velcro on their Nikes to run around until the lift arrived, but not us, no sir. We were here to kick worm arsehole and eat herbs. And guess what? We were all out of herbs. The fight was a cinematic masterpiece, a clashing of two titans of the Resident Evil world. 
After an intense no holds barred fight with the force of Boeing 747, we slam our leg into Verdugu's crotch and with a blood curdling cry, Oh fuck. We take him down for good. After making it up the lift, despite leaving him tied up and left for dead, Luis finds us and is surprisingly forgiving, all things considered. He tells us Ashley was about to be transported to an island off the coast of Puebla where Leon, who'd been recaptured, was going to be sacrificed as a tribute to Ashley's ascension to Scientology. Luis offers to help get us there, and whilst it was weird having a companion other than Leon, Luis was a certified mad lad. As we drop down to the mines, Luis takes care of the fodder like an absolute chad, whilst I move in for the cinematic 1v1 with Dr. Salvador, who was here to reclaim his title of Doctor. Spoiler alert, he does not. Our fighting stars were completely synchronised and we'd become the ultimate fighting duo. We were tearing up the crowd and at one point we even sent this man flying headfirst over the bridge. You know, I never thought I would find anyone in Resident Evil 4 Remake who couldn't be kicked to death. But that was until we met the armoured El Gigante from the castle again, who was back and this time he'd brought a friend. We take down the other loincloth wearing anal swab with ease, but we couldn't do anything to the other guy. We kicked him until our toes bled, but it was no use. This walking STD was encased in 16 inch thick steel plate, which was impenetrable to my military grade nursing shoes. I used the mod from the previous challenge and we can see we might as well have been tickling him. I tried everything, even kicking him when he does this pound to the ground move, thinking I might be able to hit his exposed head, but it did nothing. The only person doing damage was Luis, but he refuses to continue shooting until we blow the dynamite up that he throws on its back. After spending a depressing 30 minutes here, reluctantly, with no other option, we shoot the dynamite, blowing up another 50% of his brain, and can either choose to dump him into the smelter or allow Luis to kill him. Eventually. And from here on out, like a stale digestive biscuit, the run starts to crumble. On the minecart ride, we have to shoot the dynamite guys to prevent the minecart from collapsing like wet tissue paper and to add insult to injury, just as me and Luis are about to break out the shampoos and celebrate escaping the mines, he takes a full 10 inches of stainless steel directly to his spinal cord. When his killer arrived, at first I thought I might be slipping into a K-hole. Maybe the acid the Novies had been marinating my face in was psychedelic or perhaps I'd been smoking too many herbs on the way up. Was I tripping out or was I standing face to face with myself? As we try to process this information, our replica moves towards us and as we feel the cold press of his knife onto our throat, it becomes immediately apparent that this was very much real. And what ensues from here is undoubtedly one of the top 10 anime fights of all time. It was like each of us knew exactly what the other was going to do, perfectly predicting and blocking each other's next moves, and for what went on for 37 minutes and 15 seconds was a stalemate. <laughs> My clone didn't want to appear to die, no matter how many times our shins made contact with his big old nose. Again, using our enemy UI mod, we can see that our clone stays at 1 HP, and no attack that we do seems to end the sequence. As opposed to staying in this infinite loop, out of morbid curiosity, I grabbed the boot knife off the wall and slashed him once, and... Yeah, despite this very obvious setback, Luis interrupts our clone's finishing move before he makes a dramatic exit. We lay Luis to rest and press on to the clock tower, and the route through here to the elevator was easy enough, but our stubby little legs couldn't reach the red pyjama guy once we were on the lift, meaning we had to endure the migraine simulator all the way to the top. We catch up to ourselves in the ceremony room just as we watch him grab Ashley. As we run to catch him up, we accidentally bump into Salazar and push him off the platform mid-speech. As he makes his return as a Mario Piranha plant, this was shaping up to be our toughest fight so far. With Salazar springing around the ceiling like a mosquito, it was nigh on impossible to swipe him down. His attacks would hit me with the force of a freight train and our melee attacks appeared to be doing nothing but annoying him. Our only option here was to make the most of the time he spent downstairs at this platform, but we also had to make sure that we remained emotionally strong as he continues to fling insults at us. You a bitch ass After what felt like an eternity and with my RSI reaching critical levels, Salazar drops his lip balm from his purse and was finally defeated. We call in our Uber who kindly drops us off at the island base entrance allowing us to begin our search for Ashley and Leon. Up ahead, we see that we were a fraction of a second behind Ashley, meaning that speed was of the essence. Nobody could stand in our way now, not whilst we were this close, and despite me awkwardly diving into the Skynet Terminators a few times, we cripple the island militia and smack down the 200 pound pig guy, Bobby Flaystar. We eventually find Leon being held captive in the prison, but in order to break him out, we would need a key card. And after interrogating one of his guards, they revealed that there was one going spare in the lab up ahead. As we made it into the old testing lab, we find a number of files documenting a series of experiments being conducted under the code name, The Weapon Y Project. Well, oh, that's just lazy writing. The project documents a series of experiments that have been conducted using our blood and the Plaga virus to produce the ultimate soldier. It was the clone that had killed Luis. Despite numerous trials and failures, this clone had apparently been hailed as the perfect killing machine. And this was slightly concerning as these failed clones were now freely wandering the facility. These fleshy little psychopaths were packing some serious heat and no matter how many limbs we removed, they just refused to die. With the floor littered with multiple arms, legs and heads, we land an explosive roundhouse causing the first clone to explode. 
which was a great sign, so we head downstairs to euthanize the remaining clones in the basement. Even when releasing my frozen brothers downstairs to end their lives, I was struck by an immediate feeling of guilt. These guys hadn't asked to be born, and as they stood there looking at me, I almost felt sad for them. But it was the right thing to do, and whilst they may not want to die, we smashed their heads in like watermelons and recode the keycard successfully. After that emotionally abusive section, we break Leon out of prison and press onwards. We battle through the bulldozer section before agreeing to split up from Leon to continue the search for Ashley. We tell Leon that we would rendezvous at the construction site at the shore where I had a jet ski stashed and ready to go to make our escape. As we continue our search for Ashley up ahead, our clone makes an appearance and tells us that whilst we may technically be brothers, only one of us would emerge from this battle victorious. I was slightly concerned here that this may be a repeat of our last battle, but after consulting the force ghost of Jean-Claude Van Damme, he gives us the advice that we need to make a difference here, and we're able to take this edge to our battles with crowds of two. We dodge his traps and fight with him at each of his key areas, and despite taking explosives to the face and permanent retina damage in the process, we're able to beat him every single time. Just when I thought we were going to have to call an ambulance for him, he pulls out the Uno reverse card, that card being an enormous arm sword. One absolute cheater. This final fight was relentless. It felt like I was passing kidney stones through my fingertips, but our focus and determination to succeed never wavered. We dodged at perfect moments and put together huge combos when we could, and after what felt like three years, Krauser 2 stumbles backwards, collapsing to the floor. We walk over, ready to put him out of his misery. We'd killed every other clone up until this point, and with him dead, it would bring an end to this nightmare. As his last breath left his body, his final words were to proclaim that we were in fact the clone and that he was the original Krauser. Before we get a chance to question him further, he opens up the console and runs the kill command. No! With this news, my mind started to spin. What did this all mean? After all this, was I was I not a real boy? Had my life up until this point been a lie? We didn't have time to dwell on my spiralling existential crisis, however, as Ashley was still out there and she was running out of time. Up ahead, a huge blockade had been erected to stop us from reaching her, but lucky for us, we'd saved our chopper gunner kill streak from earlier in the game and call it into rain death from above on everyone around us. We do have to use the mounted turret to destroy the AA gun, unfortunately, in order to fight our way through the secondary blockade. And just up ahead, we spot Ashley again being carried into the sacrificial altar. With our final objective in touching distance, we dig deep and fight off the remaining island soldiers who'd set up a last stand to stop me from reaching Ashley. As the final soldier goes down, we break into the citadel and rescue her, giving her the surgery she needed to remove her worm infestation and keep her alive. With our mission now a resounding success, we run up ahead to meet up with Leon at our jet ski extraction and tell him to take Ashley and complete the mission. We had a secondary extraction point we'd set up and we'd meet him there. However, before we could make it there, Emperor Palpatine arrives and confirms Krauser's dying statement that we were in fact the real clone and that in killing the human Krauser we'd proven that we were in fact the perfect soldier all along. With me being the only Krauser left, Palpatine says that we can now take our rightful place by his side. As we sat there absorbing all this news, we know that whilst we may have been born in a test tube, Luke Skywalker was right. I'll never turn to the dark side. Oh. We refuse Sadler's offer and begin the final showdown with his new spider form. We take blow after blow from Sadler and I started to get slightly nervous. Our kicks appeared to be falling just short of his exposed eye and it didn't seem as though we were doing any damage. After 25 minutes, we hadn't put a single bit of dirt into any of his eyes. With my fingertips eroded and my wrists about to explode, I had just enough strength to press the melee key one final time before collapsing to the floor. This final act being the killing blow to Sadler to mark the end of this epic battle. As we lay there on the cold metal of the construction site, we knew what we had to do. After my chopper gunner, I'd secured a 25 kill streak and had earned my game ending nuke. We launched it at the island to put an end to all of this. And as we watched the missile approach, we knew that even if the challenge had been a complete failure, and that we'd murdered the entire population of a Spanish village to prove that, maybe the real victory had been the friends that we'd made along the way. Well, I hope you enjoyed Krauser's emotional roller coaster of a redemption arc. Um, I tried to be a little bit more creative with the storyline this time, and it was a lot of fun to write. Uh, but yeah, challenge wise, we're sadly at two losses out of three for Resident Evil 4 Remake. I felt like Melee only was looking good until we hit the uh, armored El Gigante and Krauser. Um, but then I thought that the minecart, the water room, the two puzzles across the castle. Um, area and the AA gun, they still all require something other than melee, so actually I don't think it was ever looking good, uh, to be honest, but uh, regardless, this was a ton of fun to make and I hope you guys all enjoy. Um, as always, if you've made it this far, you're an absolute mad lad and thanks for watching.